Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Welcome to Become Famous Podcast. I'm your host, Torin, and today it is just me. And what we're, what are we, why are we just me today? Well, the reason why is taking a step back. Uh, several of you listeners have asked me, can you go a little bit deeper on the fame? You keep talking about fame and mentioning it here and there, but what is it really about? And, and you're absolutely right. So we're going to take like, go deep for at least, uh, the next five series. Uh, to really delve into the book, what is the thinking, and what is fame all about. So um, I started this book three and a half years ago, and I feel like I got a PhD. Like a professor of mine said, you don't need a PhD, just research on something and write a book, and it becomes your PhD. And so I took that quite seriously and read about fame. And why did I do that? Well, well it was because I was in Kanab, Utah, and I stuck because of COVID, happily stuck. It changed my whole life. I started an agency, a podcast, and a publishing uh, company. And in all of that, um, I started noticing things were changing because when I was in Norway, when, before I was happily stuck, I um, had clients of mine that I was informing them that I got this job here in, here in the U.S. temporarily away and we could just do things over Zoom. They didn't know what Zoom was, right? Many people didn't know what Zoom is. And I'd use Zoom because I had actually had clients in the U.S. while I was in Norway. And um, they ended the contracts because they didn't understand Zoom. They didn't want to do it. And they said, I'm, we're going to find someone local. Local schmokel. That's what we say now, right? It's like we've all gone global. Local global, right? And so during COVID, what happened was a lot of the people that I knew in Norway, I was getting quite a few clients, they didn't really feel the difference anymore. It was like COVID brought the globe together. We became more local. It was more of a time difference than anything else. And you started hiring people from the Philippines, from India, from South America, and brought in the best expertise. Like I used a cartoonist in Norway to help with the book here in the US. So in all of that, I was noticing something. And what I noticed was something had changed. And uh, people were getting used to the camera lights in action, explosion of TikTok. And I was recalling a fascinating quote that I wrote in the beginning of the book. Um, and I really like it. It's, in the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. And we've always been waiting for that 15 minutes, at least me. Like when I was in college, uh, people kept talking about we are in the 15 minutes of fame now. And, and we could see kind of, signs of it, but it didn't really happen, I believe, until we faced COVID. And COVID got everyone interested in lights, camera, and action. So what happened was, what got me to do this book? Well, I um, I was helping a client of mine when during COVID, you know, the clients were virtual they were in the u.s or norway and we had this one client where the requirement was no longer just to write a press release like i used to do like i was a communications director for a global company i worked in the government i worked in the music industry i worked in politics in the u.s and in norway and in all of that your position is people out into the media right you have there's a specific way of specific way of doing it and what I was noticing was those requirements that a politician has to do, a musician has to do, top leaders of CEO multinational corporations, is trickling down to all of us. And it was specifically to the small business that we were helping. And there was an association they were requiring no longer a press release with some key messages with the photo. No, they wanted video. And while we're doing all of this, and if you recall COVID, it's like I was in one place in the country. I was in Arizona. Uh, my colleague was in New Jersey, and our client was in Oregon, right? And so you have all of these different places, and you're trying to make things fix and change, and you got to have books stock, stock yourself up. You got to have the right lighting, and 
all of this makeshift way of creating something, right? And the client got so exasperated and said, I want to go back when I did not have to be a movie star. And that got me, completely got me, because it was flashing behind my mind all the people that I've been helping, right? Uh, worked with senators, worked with congressmen, worked in presidential campaigns, worked with CEOs, worked with musicians, uh, been in the entertainment industry with artists. And I was like, oh my gosh, what I've been doing for 20 years, helping people, now suddenly it's trickling down to more of us. More of us have to do this. And I am not someone that likes to be in front of the camera. I love to be behind the scenes. I love to polish and shine and support and coach these amazing leaders that have something to say. And what I realized, we all have something to say and we're in this revolution. And that's really all I could think of that it was. And then what was fascinating at the same time that that was happening, I always say you need to hire experts of your expertise or else you become the shoemaker's daughter or the shoemaker's son where you don't have your own shoes you're just supporting everyone else and to discipline yourself to get the help so I invested in someone to help me out with um, with the whole branding of me right how do I brand myself I have these various companies that I've started various organizations how do I brand me and uh, what they were saying is when we we're doing all these exercises was become famous and I was like become famous me become famous no that sounds a little too kitsch right and at the same time when I was pondering that pondering what my client was going through didn't want to become a movie star I stumbled upon a quote that really got me down this fame rabbit hole for three and a half years and the quote was the perfume of heroic deeds is fame and I was like wow that really got me and so I went down a rabbit hole of fame I did the history of fame I um, interviewed I I probably have like in my book 15, 15 pages of resources. I feel like I read everything there's out there. You, you can't completely read everything. And when you now have um, chat GPT, it kind of reminds you that you don't know everything. But I read as much as I could and I learned a lot reading articles and pondering. And what happened was there was another quote that came into my horizons when I was researching this and it's by Chris Hayes he is a television uh, political tell about he's got his own television show he's an American political commentator and he's an activist and author and he said something that really got me because he said the era of fame is upon us it's here right and and I felt like um, Andy Warhol saying that looming over us Gen Xers we are now in the 15 minutes of fame. We are now in the 15 minutes of fame. And and I really don't think it happened until COVID where it really became all of us, this mass fame for everyone. And what was interesting was I was then researching and there was a documentary on Andy Warhol on Netflix, fantastic um, documentary if you want to learn more about what he was thinking and not just the fame comment, but just his whole sense of looking at art and life. And in that Fab Five Freddy, who is an American visual artist, filmmaker, and hip hop pioneer, said something that really just confirmed what I was researching, that 15 minutes of fame is here. Practically everyone on the planet can be famous for real. So in my research then, I found out, and I was really surprised about this, that 86% of the world's population has a smartphone, smartphone, right? And with a smartphone, you can do anything, right? Look at what you can do in TikTok. You do the videos, the reels. You can have a podcast. You can do, you can have documents. Like I, I know that I can go walking and I can send a fax if I actually have to send a fax, which is usually more to institutional organizations. But you can do anything through your smartphone. You don't necessarily need a laptop anymore. And in all of that we all have one degree away from being famous. If we are able to come with something viral, something amazing, it can go all over the world in an instant. 
and you can be canceled in an instant, which is exactly what celebrities, politicians, or public figures are facing today. And so I went through that, and not only that, what I thought was interesting is we're competing with the world, 86% has a smartphone. And what I was interesting when I was researching, I was asking chat, like, how many things has the phone replaced? And we came to 33 components. And I think there's more, but really, that's how much this phone has replaced. Usually your office was kind of with papers all over. You don't need papers. You can just work on the phone. You can read your books there. Um, you don't need to have a whole shelf of your music. Your music is in there. Everything is in your phone. And so you're competing with the world. And not only that, you're competing with AI. AI is our friend today, but where does really AI going to happen? What is going to happen with us? And so we're in this revolution. And what I noticed was that more so than ever, before you could just write a press release, I'd write prescriptive language, as I call it, prescriptive language, very much corporate ease language, right? This is how you do press release. This is how formal you are. But that's all thrown out the window because what's happening right now, there's so much attention out there. What do you do with the attention? You've got to stand out. So I just thought all of that was really interesting. So I say that we are in the fame revolution because the way you used to do marketing, the way you used to do communications is not the same anymore. And it's really what I've learned. And I think the best strategy is what I learned in politics and then what Hollywood does on how they look at you as a public figure. And my whole mission right now is that we all need to look at each other as a public figure. So I'm going to find what I did was, so we're saying we're in the fame revolution. And then what I realized is we're in the fame economy. There's a new currency out there. And it's, and it's kind of a currency that compiles a lot of the various ways we've differentiated economies. There's all these economies. And when I was going into my rabbit hole, I was finding all of these different definitions of economies. And I, I want us to kind of tap into that because it kind of showcases how the laddering of the last 50 years has really been a laddering to a fame economy where the currency now is authenticity and visibility. Um, so the first economy we have is the attention economy, which was in 1960s and it was coined by Nobel laureate Herbert A. Simon, who championed the significance of capturing focus in an increasingly distracting world. That was in the 1960s. Can you imagine how big it is now? And a lot of these economies, what I've learned is they start maybe 20, 30 years before it actually goes full blown. But that was attention economy. Then you've got the entertainment economy, which I myself really changed my whole perspective of communications. I was in Wash I was in New York City taking a class on in from Institute of Media Entertainment on how to manage talent. And we were learning about Michael J. Wolf in 1999. And he had highlighted the entertainment economy. And I was really perplexed because I didn't read about him in 1999. I read about him in 2006. And in 2006, you could see banks were using entertainment. They were using Elton John music to get people excited, right? And I learn and that was Citibank and then what I learned was I needed to bring more entertainment and I think one of the reasons why I was successful in the various positions I had afterwards was that I was using entertainment I was using film premiere in an oil and gas company I was uh, utilizing the Jason Bourne myth, um, kind of feel and touch to get people excited about what we were doing so in that component he has the entertainment so you have to be entertaining to get kind of attention right but then what I really liked was Gary Vaynerchuk came out with a book in 2011 that really brought more depth to our economy. It's about thank you, right? We need to treat people well. We need to say thank you. And I think that's a very important component into life. And that was in 2011. And then 2017, you have Philip Christian uh, Dirkono, who then created the trust economy, like the essence of society is trust, right? 
And then we have a little bit later in 2019, we had Joseph Pine and James Gilmore come up with the experience economies. You need, you need to have an experience. An experience kind of builds upon attention, entertainment, and thank you and trust. It creates this experience. And then what I would say is the fame economy builds upon all these economies. And in that the ultimate currency is to be recognized for what you do, to be visible and to be most visible with what you do is to be authentic. And so what I write in my book and kind of quoting it and putting it all together is what I say here is to truly achieve fame, one must capture attention like we do in the attention economy, spice it with elements of entertainment like the entertainment economy, connect and honor our relationships on all level by saying thank you and crafting in that trust Memorable experience, reminiscent of the experience economy, and in all of this, build the trust of the trust economy. So in essence, fame today requires a multifaceted approach, blending attention, entertainment, experience, trust, and gratitude. And that is really what I, I see uh, with fame. And what does this all mean? It means that average is over. And Thomas Friedman said that in the early 2000s in a fantastic book called The World is Flat, which is kind of predicting where we are right now. It's flat. We are we are utilizing resources from all over the world to make our days work. It's not just the big multinational corporations. And what it really means is how do we stay in the top 20%, top 4%, which is what Tony Robbins talks about. You don't have to be in the top 1%, but to be in that top 4%, 4% is key. It's kind of like getting an A. A is in the top 4%. You don't need an A plus, but you need an A. If you go an A minus, B, B plus, there's a lot, there's a lot more competition. So being at that high level is where you want to be. And what I have noticed when I've been helping people and helping clients positioning themselves in their industry sector, what we like to say is we like to help them become in the top 4%, not the 1%, but the 4%. Uh, because you don't have to be 1%. You have to work so much to get to the 1%, but you can still do really well if you're in the top four is what, is what we say. And what was really fascinating is, is that we all need to be there now. Now we can't really, and that's where kind of fame inflation, all this comes in, but it's really sticking out. And how do we stick out from all of this? Well, it is really about us, our differentiator is us it's our competition it's how we go there but what i thought was interesting in this fame revolution what has has changed is you've got this fame economy where the currency is really becoming known for what you do how do you become known what has been proven is to find the authenticity in your heart the greatest differentiator is you only you can be authentically you right but in that, haven't you noticed that things have changed? And I think this is why it's such a revolution. Before, everything was hierarchy and hierarchy, right? So, you know, the top leaders were saying something and it would trickle down. But now we have this communication that goes back and forth, back and forth, right? And you are the arbiter, just as much as someone from an elite group where you can put thumbs up, thumbs down, or you kind of like it. You can swipe. You can make something irrelevant. You can make something relevant. And that, to me, is what one of the big changes of this fame revolution. It's that you've got the power. Because when 86% of the world has a smartphone, everyone has a chance of making it. And if they suddenly strike a chord on a message, it can go big. Now, there are some uh, arguments about that you need to do advertising. You need to bring things out there. But... If you have enough people and enough things, you can actually make ripple effects. And this is where you're seeing stars getting canceled. You're seeing the, the movement of, of the group, the greater group, can actually topple people down. And I was really fascinated by this, kind of like you're no longer just telling people what to do. You're no longer just communicating. There is this much more back and forth. So you have the power, but everyone else has the power. You've got the power to be a media conglomerate, as I say. You can do whatever you want with the phone, but everyone else has that. And what's the power? The power is like, down, yes, right? And so what I thought was interesting, and I'll never forget this with um, when I was having a housekeeper here, getting it through one of those apps, uh, was testing it out, and I was giving a tip, which I usually do when someone's helping out that way, 
And when I gave the tip and I was just being myself and she just looked at me and she said, hmm, I'm going to rate you five stars. And I was like, what? I get rated? But we all get rated like that. Like in Airbnb, you're getting rated. Uber, you're getting rated. If you're, if you don't treat the person that's serving you well, you get a bad rap. And when you get the bad rap, no one's going to want you. And what I thought was so fascinating with that is it really goes into how times have changed. It's the up thumb, the down thumb, up here. We all have that power. And it reminded me of what Loveline R. Brenna, who is an author of Diversity Leadership, she's a global leader on that, actually is part of the team that is creating an international standard on what does it really mean to be a diversity leader. And uh, what was so interesting was I was talking to her with this book, interviewing her and like, oh, my gosh, we have all this power. Uh, and you almost wish you were like beforehand. Right. And she goes, well, this is an exciting time to be because you have the power. But with power, you have responsibility. And I think that is what us Gen Xers and possibly millennials that are not brought up on this social media, we forget that. I think all of us forget it. We just think about our where we are in our lives. But what I thought was so interesting is there's a lot of power, there's a lot of excitement, but there's a lot of stress with it. And we were talking, uh, we were in, we were reading on on a professor of psychology saying there's not enough study on the stresses of fame, the stresses of standing out there. Um, and I think a lot of times people with substance, you know, that really have something to say is ruminating thinking how do I do this the best way because you're kind of taught through school to be perfectionists in what you're doing and in that in that conflict or in that inertia of trying to be perfect someone that maybe doesn't have as high standard just goes out there and there is a reward of the person that has the courage to say things first and sometimes it doesn't have the highest quality and so some people are arguing that we are in the narcissistic age because everyone's putting a selfie on themselves focusing so much on them and people that would pride themselves not to be that way might not like where we are and so it's a very tumultuous time and I'm really hoping to discuss this more with people because it's not just my view of that we're in the fame revolution there's a fame economy but what is the ramification of that and some people will say that we are in a fame inflation and and it could be true are we experiencing fame inflation and I have to say when I wrote this book I was thinking no we're not really in a fame inflation but I do think certain sectors are being inflated with a lot of people with the same kind of voices. And it's interesting, like right now on TikTok, you can end up getting zero to 50 points. And the reason why is because your message is so much similar to someone else. So I always thought my message of, oh, I am an introvert. I think it's horrible to be out there. I'm so, I'm, I, I'm feeling uncomfortable. This is really not where I want to be. I want to be behind the scenes. But how many people are saying that? And so my message is bland. And so it's not getting a good enough rating. And it's it's hard, right? You're you're thinking what you're feeling is unique, and then you're feel, seeing that so many other people have that. But what I do like is Marcus Bellinger, who's an American music producer, influencer, entrepreneur, and I like his definition. He defines fame as visibility to a particular target audience. And 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 I think this is where we don't have to feel like that we are being competing with everyone and there's no room for us. I do believe there is room for everyone. I think there is this feeling of a fame inflation, but I would say I like what Marcus Bellinger says. And he was talking about how fame can be a small and securing visibility to a customer or even visibility to a love interest. And I think that's true. I think we all have these gifts that we can bring out. And by bringing out that gift, people are going to want to see us, our unique way of doing it. And I, I think a lot about Coca-Cola and Pepsi, right? There was one point I thought, well, me starting this agency, everyone's doing personal branding, so there's no need for me. And then uh, this consultant that was helping me laughed, and he was saying, well, no one's going to do your personal branding your way, and someone's going to want it the way you do it. And that's kind of like Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Would Pepsi say there's no need for me because... We have Coke. No, you got Coke and Pepsi and they got different personalities. They got diff a little bit of a different taste, but there is the sense that there is room for us. And what I really like is Professor 
Tyler Cohen from George Mason University. He wrote a fantastic book called What Price Fame? And he was doing that 20 years ago. And you're like, oh my gosh, we've been thinking about fame. But I really think now is the flourish, flourishing of fame. He goes, fame is a positive sum came where everyone can benefit and there's room for everyone to succeed. And so, and I, th and I really like that. And really what, what I, what I say is that fame is achieved by becoming known within your circle, whether it's local, regional, national, or industry level. And the ultimate goal is to showcase your unique talents within the community and create the desired impact. And so what is actually fame? And I think this is where I want to end uh, this podcast is that we have a fame revolution where everyone can now become known for what they do. You have a more powerful voice by thumbing up, thumbing down, going like this, swiping or reading it and engaging with it. You have more power and a voice than you've ever had before. And and we kind of like even with me, we have this kind of negative connotation with fame. I didn't really see the positivity of fame until I read this with Socrates saying the perfume of heroic deeds is fame. And I think what's really key is what is fame not when you look at the actual definition. It's not celebrity and it's not being an influencer. And I really like what Joe Piazza says uh, in her book from Celebrity Inc. She defines celebrity as commodity bought and sold by fans. Influencers, on the other hand, are paid by companies to promote products on social media. And fame in its purest sense is different from both celebrity and influencer in that it focuses on the visibility to target audiences to which a person has made a lasting impact. And this takes me to, and I was telling you, I was reading all this history on fame and what I thought was fascinating, I'll probably do an episode just on that, the forefathers in fame. And there was this wonderful author, uh, his name, historian Douglas Adler, that focused a lot on the forefathers in fame because they were contemplating a lot what is actually fame and so what he says and i like this a lot is fame has to be earned fame can never be a gift it cannot be inherited it must be won by person who imposes their will their ideas for good or ill upon history in such a way that they can always be remembered and so in my next episode we're going to talk about the root of fame where i really start with all of how like fame is more than just the way we think of it kind of in a narcissistic way. So just to recap right now uh, on this episode, really in the beginning, is that times have completely changed. And I think that is something we all should, uh, we feel it. I mean, I was, I was so fascinated when Tony Robbins and Dean Graziosi a couple of weeks ago were like having this huge campaign on everything has changed. The game plan has changed. And I was like riding on that go, yes, things have changed. We're in the fame revolution. And, uh, and I think that's really what's really important for us to notice is that we are in a times when things have changed. 30 plus something has taken over our phone. We have one phone. 86% of the world has a smartphone, not just a mobile phone, but a smartphone. They have the potential to be a media conglomerate. What I basically say is you can be a media conglomerate. You can do movies. You can do podcasts. You can do anything from this phone. And then you have AI competing with us. And we have all of this together. And in it, it's an exciting time to be alive. It's a stressful time, but it's also an exciting time in that you have got the power to say yes, to say no, to say ah. And you have the voice of someone else giving you thumbs up, thumbs down, yes. And if suddenly something clicks, you can go viral and become famous. So that, my friend, is, is this episode. And I'm going to go into in the next one on the ancients' viewpoint of fame, which I think is a really fascinating one, which really made me feel like, oh, I can talk about fame. It's not just something cheesy, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> It's really got something for all of us who are reluctant to be out there, which I think is really important. It's important for us to have our voice out there. So have a lovely day and um, until next time. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keep bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry keep shining and see you next time.